what's happened is that the mechanisms that triggered this extraordinary run of economic development, absolutely unprecedented in human history before 1800, are now a worldwide possession. So that China and India and Southeast Asia and Brazil and soon, I believe, Africa can also experience the rapid economic development. And by virtue of the fact of catching up, which is the crucial idea, that it's economics is a lot about technology and economic development is a lot about adopting technologies that are already available from technology leaders but have not yet diffused to technology followers, thus giving the opportunity for a very quick catching up. By virtue of that catching up process, the gap between the rich and the poor will narrow. And the most dramatic aspect of that is the rise of China. Because that's 1.3 billion people, because the per capita income, though hard to measure with precision, is rising probably at 8 to 10 percent per year because by the rule of 70, that means uh, that the doubling time is 70 divided by 8, which is a little bit uh, less than 9 years, or 70 divided by 10, which means a 7-year doubling time, which means we've got an extraordinary process of catching up underway compared to the growth rates of the U.S. economy in per capita terms, which are about 2% per year, a doubling time of 35 years. So I believe that we've changed from a period of divergence to a period of convergence. I'll say a little bit more why in just a few minutes. The second fundamental driver is the continuing explosion of the number of us, human beings on the planet. The rate of that explosion has slowed considerably, but the absolute increases of the human population on the planet continue to be very significant, about 85 million population increase every year, adding a full Germany every year to the world's population. This is taking place now mainly in the poorest countries of the world. That's where the population growth rates are the highest. But in a world economy of open borders, mass migration, and all the rest, the consequences are felt everywhere. The projections are that what went from a population of roughly 1 billion around 1830 to 2 billion in 1930, and then very fast increments to three, four, five, six billion, and now it's about 13 years to add a billion, though it's gradually slowing, we're on a trajectory to reach about nine billion people by the year 2050 under current trends. There's nothing inevitable about the exactitude of those trends, to be sure, and one of the things that I'll come back to say is that I think we ought to do is try to achieve a voluntary slowdown faster so that the population only reaches about 8 billion people in the world rather than 9 billion. A certain amount is inevitable increase right now just from the momentum of the young population in the poor countries growing up to be parents and that is going to increase by sheer momentum a population of another billion or so barring disaster. But we have some choices. No matter what actually happens, the likelihood is the planet gets a lot more crowded. And each of those people being born naturally wants and expects a full life. Uh, and that means a, a full material life as well. And that means all of the amenities of modern technology and that leads to the third point of fundamental driver, and that is that when you combine the now near universality of economic development 
that eludes roughly about a fifth of the world or a sixth of the world, but covers now roughly 80% of the world, and eludes the part that I talk about in, in my book, The End of Poverty, that's the focus is on the, on, the on the bottom poorest part, but for most of the world there's a lot of progress and there are a lot more people. When you combine those two facts, what we have is a world economy of unprecedented scale. That means use of resources, land, water, fossil fuels, hunting, fishing, clearance of uh, land, and so forth, at a scale never before experienced on the planet, likely to become even more intense in its effects on the planet in the next 40 or 50 years. Today, Al Gore received the Nobel Prize for, uh, for his work on, uh, on climate change. And the point about climate change is very simple to put, which is that if we just continue what we're doing now, same population, same fossil fuel burning, we would wreck the planet by the end of the century, if not sooner. But we're not on a path to do just what we're doing. The path that we happen to be on is a path which could raise by a factor of between three and six the amount of energy we use by mid-century which means that if you think it's bad now, the normal growth built into this age of convergence combined with the population increase coming means that the burden of human activity on the physical environment is going to multiply tremendously from an already unsustainable rate. So we really have our work cut out for us. It's not good enough to just run and stand in place. In other words, it's not even good enough just to try to hold the line on carbon emissions. That won't do. We have to somehow combine economic growth with a reduction and a sharp reduction of human emissions of carbon dioxide and other human effects on the physical Earth. And I'll, when I come back to this, I'll give a name which I really like, uh, christened by Paul Crutzen, a Nobel laureate in chemistry who was one of the discoverers of the ozone depletion effect. And he calls our age the age of the Anthropocene. You know, the uh, geologists have the Pleistocene and the Holocene the Ice Age and the post-Ice Age, and he said we've moved from what a geologist would call the Holocene, our current interglacial, to what he calls the Anthropocene, meaning that the real driver of the physical Earth now is people, not the, not, not the orbit of the Earth, which is the main driver of, uh, of uh, the Ice Age cycles. So he says it's the human age, the Anthropocene, which now dominates. And it's a very uh, potent observation. And we're obviously completely unequipped for it right now. The news has not reached the White House yet about the Anthropocene. Uh, and uh, it will have to reach the ears of the next president, because this president won't get it uh, before January 20th, 2009. And then he can read about it in his spare time. Um, and the, the last fundamental driver, which I think is quite interesting, is the idea that while in general I'm a kind of economic optimist because I'm a believer in technology as being the basic driver of economic improvement and I'm a big believer that technology is ideas and I'm a big believer in the spread of ideas. So for me, it all comes down to the fact that technology is good ideas, and good ideas can be shared, can be absorbed, and therefore, whatever good ideas uh, rich world has can be, in some way, under appropriate circumstances, useful to the poorer world, and thereby have a broad-based economic progress. There are 
places on the planet that are not part of that process. And in category four, I use this tendentious name that's used, failed states. That technically really should be reserved for the government structures of uh, societies where government can't perform its core functions of being uh, the legitimate monopoly of violence, for example, uh, or the, uh, the locus of, uh, of law. Uh, these are places like Somalia, for instance, where there is no rid of the state, or places in civil war, or places that are so impoverished that even if there is a political unity and even intentionality of government, there's often no means to carry out the most basic services of commercial law or provision of infrastructure or disease control. And these places could be called generally failed states. Now, we've always had state failure for uh, all of human history. What's different now? Well, one thing is probably there are fewer failed states, uh, so that's the good news. But on the other hand, what's also different now is that disasters that befall a failed state can have worldwide repercussions fairly easily. And I always do think if I were asked on September 10, 2001, not perhaps not knowing uh, just uh, on basic principles, choose a place in the world least likely to bother us here. Probably, I would say, on general geographical principles, I'll take the center of the Eurasian landmass. I mean, how could Kabul bother us? And of course, 9-11, among many other things, was a, uh, what was a, uh, an attack uh, inflicted uh, by a base of operations in Afghanistan. And that means that there is really no connection on the world, no such thing as the place that is uh, a place that is just too far away to care about. That's true not only in the humanitarian sense, it's true in the political sense, very real political sense. It's also true in the public health sense and in others as well, diseases that can absolutely ruin your day, like AIDS, uh, started in a jungle in West Africa. So why the hell should we care about uh, a chimpanzee hunter uh, in the West African rainforest? Well, it turned out because the zoonotic disease that went from that chimpanzee to the human and then spread around the world has uh, now uh, infected 40 million people and claims several million deaths a year. So there is no sense of an isolated place anymore. And that's why I think we do, that's in a sense uh, always been a surprise and true. I mean, why would a gunshot in Sarajevo start the, the worst war in our history in, in, or the most, uh, the, the biggest upheaval? Uh, and it does. But here it's even more remote and less likely and less understood places. And again, I think our politics are very poorly considered for all of this. So these are the four drivers that I think are critical. The four drivers being convergence, demography, ecosystem pressures, and interlinkages on the downside meaning that your system better function pretty resiliently and robustly, and you better avoid accidents and care about them. In the end, how does one address these concerns uh, beyond analysis? And what I'm going to argue is that all of these are, to an extent, under human control, if you will. They're all politically mediated phenomena. We have choices on all of them. And the choices are going to make a great deal of difference. So stepping back, trying to see the big picture of the underlying tectonics that are shaping the world and then understanding what are the risks of earthquakes that are coming from this is quite useful because we're not simply spectators in these events. We can actually take political decisions. 
There's a problem, though, that I think is a, a logical corollary of this way of thinking, which is that the political decisions we need to take are more global than ever. In other words, we really need global decision making. We're not so great at that either, you probably noticed. But since you're going to be the ones making the global decision making in the future, it's worth your trying to figure out how to do it. I think that most of these issues cannot be solved on a national level. The most preposterous thing in the world is the United States trying to act unilaterally. This is just an absolutely poor diagnosis of the underlying drivers. It's thinking 19th century thinking in the 21st century. It wouldn't even have worked in the 20th century, but it definitely is the 19th century thinking a couple centuries late. So maybe George Bush would have been a good sheriff in Texas in 1840. But uh, he's, from my point of view, an absolutely miscast president in the 21st century because the style of foreign policy is completely different from what you need if you're taking the global shapers as, as the main drivers of, of politics. So let me say a few uh, words about each of these. And I'm going to try to stop at um, 5.15, and you're going to have lots of arguments and questions ready. Uh, and then we'll spend uh, at least a half an hour uh, or 45 minutes uh, discussing those. So the first point is I want to divide the world, little artificially, but I think helpfully, into an age of divergence and an age of convergence. And I'm putting the break point at 1950. And by this, I'm taking an economic perspective where I'm arguing that the gaps of, between rich and poor widened significantly in the first two centuries of the Industrial Revolution. A few minutes ago, I called it 150 years. Actually, the steam engine was invented around 1719, but it wasn't very functional. Uh, by 1750, it had been improved a bit. England was beginning its industrialization in the second half of the 18th century, but just England. It's really in the beginning of the 19th century that the concepts of the Industrial Revolution take off, and mainly at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. From then until the end of the Second World War, I would claim, there was basically divergence in the world economy, with one huge <laughs> exception. So the divergence was that the North Atlantic and a couple of other settler sites, which are from a d demographic point of view minor, but from a political and case perspective interesting, and that's uh, Australia and New Zealand, aside from a few places, the North Atlantic, Oceania, uh, and uh, Japan, this was an era where the rest of the world was on the receiving end of industrialization, and the real industrializers were the United States and Western Europe, in essence. And the rest of the world got some industry, but mainly it got conquered by those who got industry. And I believe that uh, there were essentially these three forces of divergence that were important at the time. A concentration of technological capacity. That's, if I were a historian, I'd say, Sachs, you're all wrong. It goes back 300 years before that. It doesn't in economic terms, but it might in explaining the Industrial Revolution. But whatever it is, there was a concentration of technological capacity that was pretty much unique in the world in Western Europe and in the United States, and then only Japan as a country that developed this capacity as a follower country in the 19th century. Second was resource endowments. The key to success in the 19th century, one key was you had to have coal. If you didn't have coal, forget it. You needed coal because the motive force of the Industrial Revolution was the steam engine. And then at the end of the 19th century, uh, through science and technology, it was learned how to mobilize 
water power for hydroelectricity and how to use petroleum in internal combustion. But before that, it was coal. And that was a fundamental driver of industrialization. If you look at where the coal deposits are, they're not in Africa, and they're not in most of South America, and they're not in much of Asia, but they are a bit in Japan, some in China, uh, a lot in Russia, all through Western Europe and the United States. And that made a big difference. And then, at least in a very simple, little bit cartoonish, but I think uh, accurate way, this burst of technological innovation combined with the energy base, which was the fundamental resource need for industrialization, energy, fossil fuel, gave such an advantage of military power that it led to an enormous explosion of conquest. There was already colonial rule all through the Indian Ocean and uh, on the margins of Africa. But with the Industrial Revolution, this became wholesale takeover. And that definitely widened the gap still further because it was almost impossible to achieve industrialization under colonial domination. Because the colonial system of every imperial power was designed to hinder or at least not give any basic support to the industrial process, but mainly to extract raw materials for the home country. And so the political dominate, and certainly not to educate anybody, uh, or almost anybody, but a very, very thin uh, uh, indirect rule class in colonial countries. And so from my point of view, this was a major amplifier of this initial takeoff. So an initial takeoff of Europe followed by the imperial era was a widening still of the gap between those who did industrialize and those who didn't. And the receiving end of this was pretty painful. It was conquest. Uh, it was uh, a lot of exploitation. Um, a lot of uh, being on the receiving end of a tremendous racist ideology for two centuries and very hard to develop. And so I completely reject the idea of, uh, of uh, Neil Ferguson at Harvard, for example, that empire was the, these were the pipes of modernization. He's written praise of empire, how the British Empire modernized the world. Nonsense, in my view. It was much better, thank you, if England had stayed there and we could have traded, it would have been much better. And uh, you didn't need empire for modernization. Japan was a very good example of watching, learning, responding out of fear, of course. It was the fear of conquest that led to the Meiji Restoration in 1868 and that set off the trigger of modern development. But it was Japan's sovereignty that enabled industrialization to take hold. So what happened? Well, a couple of things happened. First, fundamentally, fundamentally, economic development is based on ideas, even more than it's based on coal. Coal's important, but it turned out coal was just one of many motive forces. Oil turned out to be useful, eat more easily transportable. Uh, natural gas, other sources of power, hydroelectricity, and so on. You could actually trade for energy, so you didn't have to own it after a while. Ideas matter fundamentally. Literacy spread. And Europe went into a paroxysm of self-annihilation in two world wars and Great Depression. And without that, probably that imperial era would have la lasted a lot longer, maybe another 50 years. It would have come to an end because people don't like to be ruled by other people particularly. But the end of the imperial era was as much a self-destruction of Europe as it was a, a, a victory of liberation. It was a, an exhaustion after two world wars and the rise of uh, Bolshevism as a as another path. 
So by 1950, at the end of World War II, the politics of conquest was put into reverse because Europe was too exhausted to maintain its empires. The diffusion of ideas and technology had gone on far enough that it became possible for this phase of catching up to start taking hold. And Japan had invented the model of catching up. All Asian success, in my view, is the Japan success repeated uh, in uh, several variants. Japan invented techno technological catching up. How do you imitate the leader? How do you leapfrog? How do you reverse engineer? And did it magnificently and then helped spread that in a variety of ways to Korea, Taiwan, partly through uh, the legacy of empire in a peculiar and subtle way, uh, and then through direct investments in Malaysia and Thailand uh, and so forth. And then all that example became the main example for China in the opening under Deng Xiaoping in 1978, and that was absolutely fundamental because China represents one-third of Asia's population. And India, in a similar way, another roughly one-third. And this process uh, is, uh, in my opinion, off and running very, uh, very deeply and, uh, and uh, irreversibly except for global disaster. So I believe that what we're seeing is the end of the period of widening, and now we're in the catching up phase, which is natural. And the techno technological leaders are not so far ahead technologically of the technological followers anymore that the engine of new innovation keeps the spread widening. And in any event, the diffusion of good ideas now is so fast that even if the United States were the lab unique laboratory of innovation, U.S. innovations would quickly spread to the rest of the world and not lead to this persistent widening that technological innovation in the 19th century did. Well, this is all, every word I've said is contestable, obviously. This is all hunch. But if it's true, it's pretty significant because it really means a deep reshaping of the world, of the meaning of the West, of the meaning of the rich and the poor countries, of the developed and the developing world, and of the relative power of the United States, which I think is bound to diminish tremendously, not because of a collapse of the US, but simply because of rise of other powers. And so that's the relative concept, and I think that it's a pretty much a likely phenomenon. And as far as I'm concerned, fine, because it, it basically means the spread of prosperity to more parts of the world. So one way to think about this is in terms of GNP shares, and this is uh, an, an attempt using the data by Angus Madison, who's our great macro historian who makes GNP accounts over centuries. Uh, of what this means for Asia, the West, and uh, that is not Afria, Africa, uh, and Latin America. And uh, the idea here is using a simple convergence model to allow for catching up growth to take place. So the poor grow faster than the rich, but as they get richer, they slow down. So they don't overtake the rich, they just converge with the rich. That's the way this model works. If you let it run forever, everybody ends up with the same level of income in the, quote, long run. Okay, that's how the mathematical assumptions work. And the thing that I'm interested in is mainly the Asian U. Asia was more than 50% of the world economy from most of modern history because Asia's been home to about two-thirds of the world's population for, as, for two, 2,000 years, as far as we know. And everybody used to be poor, 
before 1800. So the share of the world's population was just the, sh the share of the world's GNP in a region was roughly its share of population. There weren't big discrepancies of who was rich and who was poor. Then came the Industrial Revolution, and a place with small population could have a big share of income. And so what happened was the West became dominant. And that's these bars here, obviously, the, the red bars. And the share of Asia in the world economy fell from 60% to 20%. And the share of Asia in geopolitics fell from 60% to 20%, if I could put it that way, in naive terms. And now this process is reversing, as we see every day, like the African leaders telling uh, the uh, European leaders at the summit yesterday, sorry, we're dealing with China now. They didn't quite put it that way. They said, still give us aid, but we are also dealing with China now. But you could tell the whole flavor of the relationship of Africa and Europe has changed because there's another, uh, another party in the negotiations now. And so the idea that Europe can just dictate the following terms is passe. And that's what Europe is finding because they're interested in having geopolitical influence in, Europe, in uh, Africa. They used to just be able to demand it, but now they can't demand it because there's competition from China and increasingly from India as well. So the African governments are saying, sorry, we don't want to negotiate this kind of treaty with you, and we'll do this our way, and we'll do this this way. It's interesting change of uh, politics. And if you project, Asia becomes, again, more than 50% of the world's population. Now, on this model, by the way, Africa and Latin America, the yellow bar uh, rises uh, significantly. Africa is, I don't know, maybe 2% of the world's GNP right now and about 13% of the world's population. What's very interesting demographically is that Africa will be more than 20% of the world's population soon. That in and of itself is a remarkable phenomenon. But if there is economic catching up in Africa also, Africa all of a sudden becomes a much more significant player geopolitically as well. Seems strange in a way, but it's, uh, but it's actually, I think, quite likely. So these are the change of uh, GNP. And this is just to say, if you run this kind of model mechanically out uh, right now measuring GNPs in so-called purchasing power parity adjusted dollars, that's using international prices to value all the different economies at the same set of prices, the U.S. is roughly twice the size of the Chinese economy right now. A little bit more than twice the size, actually. So the U.S. is about a $14 trillion economy. China's about a $6 trillion economy. That's, in per capita terms, the gap's much wider because China's also four times the population. So that means about an eighth the per capita income level. But with China's rapid growth, by 2025, China will probably be a larger economy than the United States. And by 2050, India will be a larger economy than the United States. Not in per person terms, but in total. One of the reasons, by the way, is India's population is continuing to increase in a mind-boggling amount in absolute terms. By 2050, India is expected to have a population of 1.6 billion. It's 1 billion today. I don't know if you've been to New Delhi. It's awfully crowded. And if you've been to the countryside in India, it's awfully crowded. It doesn't feel like the countryside anywhere. And the population is going to add, oh, another 600 million people. So there are a lot of question marks on this. But the point is that this is of fundamental geopolitical significance. So let me say just a few more words about uh, the demography. The oddest thing in development is that 
The rich have few children. They can afford them, and they choose to have few. And the poor have lots of children and can't afford to raise them. And this is a, can be rationalized as a individually rational strategy for households under different conditions of returns to children, individual uh, investments in children and mortality risk. In poor settings with high mortality risk, it pays to have lots of children and invest less in each one. Whereas in circumstances of low mortality risk of children, it pays to have a few children and invest very heavily in them. That's one kind of interpretation of this phenomenon. But it leads to the odd point that however you slice it, the poorest places in the world are experiencing the largest population increases by far. That's a big problem when we come to the failed states because these places have already demonstrated that they're having a very hard time with technological catching up. And higher populations in general do not make that easier. Doesn't make it easier for two reasons. One is that a poor family cannot afford to invest in six children with proper educations for each of them. So the children end up undereducated, undernourished, undertended in health terms, and therefore poor when they grow up, so you replicate poverty. And second, the rise of population is putting tremendous ecological stresses on what are very fragile ecosystems. So the highest fertility rates in the world are in Africa, in tropical Africa. That's just missing data, but it actually would be read the same way in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Basically, uh, fertility rates above six that's kind of a mess from an economic development point of view. Having six children, maybe two of them do not survive. So a woman will have four children surviving to adulthood. And two of those, on average, will be girls. So each mother will be raising two mothers to adulthood. And that's the easy way to realize that a fertility rate of around six means that the population doubles every generation. So on average, you have a doubling of the population every 25 years. That's a lot. That's really hard to keep ahead of as a development economist, I can tell you. Because you're trying to help figure out what's a pathway for Africa out of poverty, and then, oh, by the way, there'll be twice as many people in 25 years, too, that you have to look after to raise for the schools, for the clinics, for the water, for the farms, for the jobs. And so this is a major, major problem, but it's a fundamental shaper of the world. This is a, an attempt, I mean, it's a heuristic attempt only, not a real forecast, but a, uh, an attempt of the United Nations Population Division to give a long-term forecast for 300 years. It's basically running out a model that allows for all places to reach the replacement fertility rate, which is two children, or a little over two children, one of them being a daughter, each mother having one daughter raised to adulthood, uh, running it out to the year 2300. And what you're seeing in the top level, it's a very, I don't know why I don't have color here. Um, what you're seeing in the top is Africa's population projection. So Africa had not so many people in 1950. Uh, what is that? These are billions, so maybe that's uh, 250 million. And by now, Africa has 800 million people. And by 2050, Africa will have 1.8 billion people on this forecast. So think about how the world is changing tremendously. Now, the part that is relatively diminishing in all of this is Europe, where the fertility rates have gone below replacement rate, and the populations are now de are expected to decline in absolute terms. In the U.S., we're at replacement rate and in migration, so the U.S. population is expected to rise from 300 million to 400 million up to the year 2050, keeping the U.S. share of the world population pretty much constant. 
Africa's share rises, Europe's share falls tremendously. So Europe's geopolitical role will definitely diminish also, but could be quite a nice life. You have all those wonderful places, fewer people, fewer crowds, and in fact, the, uh, if you run the demographic model for Italy, which has 60 million people now, if you run it to 2300, Italy has the lowest fertility rate in the whole world because they're not listening to the Pope, it seems. <laughs> so if you run a TFR, so-called total fertility rate of 1.2, which is each mother raising 0.6 of a daughter, or each 10 mothers having six daughters on average, you could see the population's going to tend to go down. Turns out that by the year 2300, there are only 600,000 Italians. Uh, in this forecast. And everyone has a giant estate again. <laughs> they all have their own vineyards. Each one can have a, you know, a hill town for themselves. Um, but that's the, that's the implication of, uh, of, of the demographics. And it does mean a pretty significant change of structure. Actually, China, because of its one-child policy, also diminishes its share of the world population. Still is large, but Instead of being, uh, as it is now, 22% of the world's population, it ends up being something like 16% of the world's population. Africa, as I said, rises to about a quarter of the world's population. That's only 45 years from now. That's a huge change. That's not a marginal little change. That's a huge change in the kind of world that you're going to be living in and leading. And so we really need to take these shapers of, uh, of that change quite seriously. One of the things that I find impressive in all of this is a comparison of what's happened between Europe and the Islamic world. Because I have a kind of demographic theory, uh, or I think de demography has been underemphasized in thinking about this 1,000 year conflict between Christian Europe and the Islamic North Africa, the Middle East, and, and, uh, and Asia Minor. Because one thing that isn't recognized, usually the way the story is told, is that, West, that Europe beat the crap out of the Ottoman Empire, if you'll excuse the phrase, because of superior institutions. That's the story we tell. And by the late 19th century, that's certainly it's not institutions, it's superior military power. But what's quite interesting is how the Ottoman Empire was a, really a long time serious rival for, with Europe up until at least the end, of the, 17th, uh, the end of the 18th century. Certainly the end of the 17th century and then the 18th century it, it lost. But a huge difference, a huge change was simply demographic which is that Europe experienced a tremendous growth of population starting around 1500. The food supply increased tremendously, settlement of northern Europe multiplied, and the, and the Islamic population pretty much stuck in the drylands of North Africa and the Middle East had very little population increase. And so the gap of the European population and the Islamic population widened tremendously. And I think that this was probably the fundamental underpinning of the shifting power between the West, as it were, and the Islamic countries, which had a lot of other advantages, but finally lost out in sheer numbers. Now, what I find interesting is that with the rise of modern technology, ability to import food against oil, health care, many other things, the, the Islamic population has absolutely soared out of sight. And it is just now reaching parity with the European population. And by 2050, will outnumber Europe. And I believe that this is part of the geopolitical change underway in the relative balance of power between Europe and its Islamic neighborhood. And I think this is being severely felt in Europe right now. 
and I think it's a real trend and change that is a reflection of this deeper underlying uh, demographic shift. Here's the ratio of the population of, at least as I have been able to measure it from you know, various atlases of global population, the ratio of the Islamic to Christian population started out about one at the beginning of the Islamic age, and then it fell to 20% by 1800 and got taken over by the West. The whole region was colonized by the West and it led to a certain amount of unhappiness, I would say, manifested in a kind of no thank you, get out of our region right now, which somehow the word didn't get to the White House in time, uh, but it was really a very bad adventure to think that Baghdad would welcome us as conquerors. Um, and now it's gone back up and it's going to exceed parity. And so this is uh, almost never remarked. It needs more serious study than I'm giving it, but I do think that the demography is really a deep shaper of the changing power right now between the two regions. And this is uh, just counting males 15 to 29. You can guess why I might do that. Because that who's fighting. And the, interestingly, in 1950 when we toppled, 53 when we toppled the government in Iran, for example, there just weren't that many young males in the Middle East compared to the number of young males in Europe. But now there are more young males in the Middle East than there are in Europe. And the young males in Europe actually don't want to go fight in the Middle East also. So that's an amplifying effect. And the young males in the Middle East are better at fighting than they were before also. And so this is why I think the age of empire is definitively over as well. And all these fantasies of the US as the sole superpower and striding the world like Rome and the last empire and all of this I think is just pure mythology. And I don't know what they were smoking when they said it. <laughs> or drinking, but uh, that's what they were doing. They were doing something. Um, they were drunk on power and other things probably. Um, one other point that I think is uh, worth very much bearing in mind is that in a global society, our internal population structures change also to reflect more of the world. And this, of course, is the profound angst of the Republican Party, maybe the saving grace of our age. They can't tell whether they want to win power or hate other people more. And so they're deeply divided on how to handle the immigration issue. The party is basically founded on hate, or a certain part of it, of people that are not like us. And on the other hand, they need their votes. And so they don't quite know which debates to show up to and how to answer and who to kick out of the country and so on. And what's interesting is that the US is, of course, becoming more like the rest of the world, ethnically, racially, demographically. And by the year 2050, according to the census, 50% of the U.S. will be non-white. So that's a huge change. That is, I should say, non-Hispanic, non-white. So Hispanic, black, Asian, other ethnicities will be 50% of the population. White, non-Hispanic, 50%. And this is, of course, look at the profound change from 1980 when it was about 77 or 78 percent white non-Hispanic. It will be 50 percent white non-Hispanic by 2050. And interestingly, of course, the Hispanic proportion is the largest proportion. These are projections that have uh, all of the risks uh, attached to them. But it was Karl Rove's strategy, to his credit, 
uh, that he was the pro-immigrant uh, conceptualizer of the permanent Republican majority. Because this is uh, one where Bush has been on the open, quote, liberal side, because the idea was to court the Hispanic vote, because they could read the same tables. These tables they did read, apparently, from the Census Bureau. But they couldn't get their own party to agree to it, because the party was founded on quite different principles, which was it was a party of just us, to put it in quotation marks. And so that's a deep division right now that is uh, changing US politics. But I think the fundamental point is this demographics is really about the internal structure as well as about the international. And the same thing could end up being true in Europe as well, where the different fertility rates of the Islamic populations in Europe, with a much more hypothetical sense of the in-migration from North Africa, Turkey, uh, and other Islamic countries has led some demographers to suggest that by the year 2050, uh, the Muslim population could be between a fourth and the fifth of the European population, and in major European cities, 40 or 50 percent. And we're seeing also the tremendous stresses on society and on politics, where this is probably the number one hot button issue in European politics now or almost surely is the, the number one issue in, in politics. So I think that this is another major point of, uh, of globalization. OK, I'm done with half my talk. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to accelerate uh, and uh, try to spend five minutes on the last uh, two, two points. All of this economic growth is weighing very heavily on the physical environment. The growth could be shut down for three kinds of reasons. None of them very good. I mean, none of them uh, very fortunate. One, obviously, is war. So everything I've said is forecasting a continuation of peace. But we're not so good at avoiding global war. I think we better, as, Tom, as the songwriter Tom Lehrer once said, if we're going to study World War III, we better study it now, because we won't have the chance to study it afterwards. <laughs> so uh, one thing that could go wrong is global war. A second thing is deep economic collapse globally. We've had one Great Depression in 200 years. And uh, it came because of World War, only because of World War. So I don't think it's in the cards, but it's not impossible. And the third thing that could go wrong is ecological damage so severe that it undermines the very ability of the world to continue to achieve this kind of economic development that it aspires to. And here the ba basic point is that the number of areas, dimensions, in which we're really messing with the Earth's physical systems is significant right now. It's not just climate. It's land. It's the nitrogen cycle. It's uh, invasive species. It's uh, diversion of water supplies. It's the depletion of uh, ocean fisheries. And so we've got very, very serious stressors in the world. And all of them relate to the global commons. All of them relate to the parts not easily governed by localities or generally by the parts even, even that can be governed by nations. And that means global cooperation needed to solve them. And so far, very low levels of it. I'm not going to talk about climate change more, except I'll say one, one more thing about it. If you look deeply at the issues of climate change, or water scarcity, or biodiversity loss, here's what I find in a nutshell. 
I find first that the current trends are just terribly dangerous. Terrible. Second, that diverting from those current trends would not cost a lot. So I find the paradox that the current trajectory is worse than you think, more dangerous than you think. And at the same time, solving it is less costly than you fear. And that, I think, is a great paradox, which is that those who say don't worry about it are absolutely wrong. Those who say worry about it because it's going to destroy our society as we know it are also wrong. The truth, I believe, is actually both inconvenient and convenient, if we look at it. Inconvenient in that it's really bad what's happening, but convenient in the sense that we are not without ways to address it. And the reason is that we're in, a, uh, we're in the predicament we are because of our superior technology, and because of our superior technology, we also have powerful tools to address the problems. So we've gotten into it because of our carelessness and because market institutions can't solve these problems on their own because the signals are all wrong. Yet the very technology that has led us down this dangerous path suggests close kinds of technologies that are much, much better. So I don't think there's anything hopeless in it. But it comes back to where I said I was going to end, and that is politics. It comes back to politics because it's not impossible to find a solution to those problems. It's just that we have to agree to do it. It's not something like a, a good film where you make it because you think you're going to be able to succeed and the market takes over. It's something we actually have to agree on to, to try to do, and agreement is politics. And we haven't agreed on these things yet. Final thing I want to say is about war and peace. And actually, I've said a lot about war and peace. There are two kinds of problems of war and peace that I think are quite distinct. One kind is war between the great powers because they drive each other crazy, competing for preeminence. And that's the World War I kind of war where Germany triggered a war because it was sure that Russia and, and Britain would never allow for German technological dominance. And so they launched a preemptive strike before they would be encircled. So that's the kind of war that one could imagine. One true cross-border war, and that's the one we started. Iraq. So this is a, a map by uh, kept data kept by CIPRI. The top line is civil conflicts, and the bottom line is interstate conflicts. And this is the point that I'm making. Most of the war we face is the top kind. Of course, we, we just need one of these to end the world if it's between the major powers. But these have been kept quite low, and it's the states falling apart or under great stress that are the biggest problem. Now, one thing that I believe to be the case is that these different categories of problems of environmental stress, demographics, poverty, and conflict are all interconnected in crucial ways, and that most of these civil conflicts have a big footprint of all three of those factors, poverty, demography, and ecology, playing a role. So I view the Darfur crisis, for example, which has been called arguably, the, uh, and arguably correctly, the world's worst humanitarian crisis. I view that as an ecological crisis because it takes place in an extremely dry part of the world that got a lot drier in the last 50 years because of climate change. A demographic crisis because the population in Darfur went from 2 million to 6 million people in the last 50 years. <coughs> and a poverty crisis because nobody can figure out how to make a livelihood, a sustainable livelihood 
in Darfur because it is a remote, interior, parched, arid, environmentally degraded home of semi-nomadic pastoralists and impoverished subsistence farmers, and nobody earns any income. So I view that conflict as basically a rupture of society that happens when the situation is so extreme. This is not how it's usually viewed. It's usually viewed as a war. Some people view it as a war of Arabs against Africans. Some people view it as a war of Dar Khartoum against Darfur, which is the western part of Sudan. But I think all of those miss the underlying point, which is that this is just an impoverished region facing more and more stress. So here's a map of showing in shaded areas the so-called dryland regions, places where there's not enough water year-round to keep soil moisture. And it ranges from sheer desert to what's called the dry subhumid and the sites of the world's conflict, violent conflicts. It's not a perfect fit by any means. About half of the conflicts now are in the drylands, the other half in places with plenty of water. It's not meant to be a monocausal explanation, but it's a disproportionate risk factor. And I believe that if we're going to get to the root causes of the conflicts, we have to get to the root causes of the environment that this uh, John John Weed is, uh, is riding over. Politics has given him an AK-47, state politics with uh, Libya, Chad, Khartoum, and so forth, but the desperation is the physical environment where maybe his ethnic group came from the north of Sudan 20 years ago because of the prolonged droughts to try to find a new point of settlement in the south, and there is no open land that way, certainly not open land with water. And so there's been a war of ethnicities since then, which Khartoum ended up siding with the, with these, uh, um, with the pastoralists. So finally, choice. This is where politics comes in. And very complicated. I've given you some, they're not even scenarios, but I've talked about fundamental drivers. The fundamental driver of convergence, the fundamental driver of population momentum, the fundamental driver of environmental stress, and the fundamental driver of failed states in the physically most challenged places in the world, the drylands or tropical rainforests with the uh, miserable soils uh, or uh, landlocked mountainous countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, the Andean region, very tough places for economic development. What are the scenarios possible to build from this? I believe that there is a scenario of not only peaceful coexistence, if I could put it that way, but actually spreading prosperity, the end of extreme poverty, the stabilization of the world's population at 8 billion, and the solution to climate change. That, I think, is not a utopian proposition. That's just a set of pragmatic choices. None of them cost very much. That, I'm an economist, so I look at the price tag. If that required 30% of our GNP, I wouldn't know what to do. But, my, my, but by my count, to get those things right would cost about 2.5% of GNP, a preposterously small number. Because we could help the poor escape the poverty trap. Contraception and family planning is really low cost compared to raising six children in the desert. or compared to the war that results. And climate change, I believe, can be faced and greenhouse gases stabilized for under 1% of world income. So none of it seems very frightening in terms of the allocation of resources. The problem, I believe, the interesting problem is 
once you've done the technical analysis, it all comes down to politics. How can we make decisions collectively? It doesn't mean, mean only state politics. By politics, I mean collective choice, not only the operation of state power. And I think that this is really the big interesting question because also collective choice doesn't operate only through state institutions, never did, but much less now than it used to. So if you think about how to actually address these problems, it does involve business, it involves civil society, it involves government, it involves international organizations and treaties, and there's no conductor of the process, certainly. There's no one locus of responsibility or authority. And the United States is not, will not be the leader of this process. It's too late in the day for that. We're only 5% of the world's population. We are perhaps 18, 19% of the world's income. Now that'll go down to maybe 12%. We got too many other things on our mind. This is not 1945 and U.S. Uh, dominance. So we're going to need to find a way for collective decision making for things like this very complicated process underway in Bali under the U.N. Framework Convention on Climate Change to be successful. That's 190 signatories negotiating. But what's also interesting is today, the Nobel Prize of Al Gore was shared with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is a body of a thousand scientists from all over the world who were able to get their act together to write a wonderful report which clarified the scientific consensus on this highly complex topic. So that's a unique, in my view, unique kind of global process, that IPCC of mobilizing rigorous science for the sake of public policy on a global scale. So it's a new kind of institution. And I think we need new kinds of global institutions that also move beyond normal politics if we're going to pull off the kind of global cooperation that needs to be achieved. Finally. I'm an optimist. Uh, I don't know how, uh, but we're going to have to do this. And uh, I like to end these days with the quotation from a, a great optimist who inspires me to uh, read and listen to, and that's President John Kennedy, who gave what I regard as the greatest speech of a modern American president in the American University commencement June 10, 1963. And what's interesting about this speech is that it was in the shadow of an even more frightening time, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the world had nearly blown itself to smithereens. And Kennedy felt this issue of choice more than ever because also he saw that most of his, his advisors would have gotten the whole world killed if he had listened to the general's advice because everybody wanted to bomb. And so this is a speech directed to the American people to basically urge them to give peace a chance and to have some hope in the ability to solve problems. And it's such a clever speech because it's about the problems of peace with the Soviet Union, but he almost doesn't say a word about what the Soviet Union should do, only about what the United States should do to make peace. So it'd be like George Bush giving a speech about Iran, saying, let's figure out how we should change our views constructively so we can make peace with Iran. Well, I'm not holding my breath, although I'd really like to see it. But that's the speech Kennedy made, and so I just want to read you two things that I think are very important to think about in terms of the global problem solving. He said, first, examine our attitude towards peace itself. Too many of us think it is impossible. Too many think it is unreal. But that is a dangerous, defeatist belief. 
It leads to the conclusion that war is inevitable, that mankind is doomed, that we are gripped by forces we cannot control. We need not accept that view. Our problems are man-made. Therefore, they can be solved by man. And man can be as big as he wants. No problem of human destiny is beyond human beings. Man's reason and spirit have often solved the seemingly unsolvable, and we believe they can do it again. I am not referring to the absolute, infinite concept of universal peace and goodwill of which some fantasies and fanatics dream. I do not deny the value of hopes and dreams, but we merely invite discouragement and incredulity by making that our only and immediate goal. Let us focus instead on a more practical, more attainable peace, based not on a sudden revolution in human nature, but on a gradual evolution in human institutions, on a series of concrete actions and effective agreements, which are in the interest of all concerned. There is no single simple key to this peace, no grand or magic formula to be adopted by one or two powers. Genuine peace must be the product of many nations, the sum of many acts. It must be dynamic, not static, changing to meet the challenge of each new generation. For peace is a process, a way of solving problems. Then he wrote what I think are the finest lines of the speech and of the modern presidency. So let us not be blind to our differences, but let us also direct attention to our common interests and the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal. Thank you very much. I know, but what have we done lately? The question I have is that he made an observation about uh, just being concerned about the sustainability over the long run yep. because he seemed to think that local government wasn't engaged enough. Um, so he worried that once the project and development workers leave, yep. those improvements will just fall away. So can you maybe just clarify the role of local government in the Millennium Villages concept and just what your thoughts are on those yeah. observations? So the, the idea of the Millennium Villages is to go to a region utterly impoverished and believe me, think about the poorest place you know and then divide by 10. Think about a place that has one physical brick structure in a square mile. It's almost unimaginable. Adobe walls, thatched roofs, no clinic, no safe water, no road, no transport. I'm thinking of Mbola, one of our villages. Sauri is not absolutely as extreme, but is extraordinarily impoverished. And then ask, what's the difference of this and viability? So the idea is basically that these are impoverished subsistence, or what we call subsubsistence communities, that can't even generate sufficient productivity to stay alive reliably, much less to have development. And the situation's been getting worse in these places. The basic economic theory is the theory of the poverty trap, which is that if you're so poor that you can't generate your basic needs, you also can't save. If you can't save, you can't get out of your trap. And in fact, you can't even hold your current ground because you're depleting your environmental resources, maybe cutting the trees or depleting the soils, 
and typically, as is true in all our village sites, the number of children is rising very fast also. There's no contraception, there's no family planning, uh, and because the poor choose a lot of children also when they see such high levels of, of death of the children. So all of this is truly unsustainable. The theory of the poverty trap is that you can convert from an unsustainable downward spiral to a sustainable upward spiral if you can raise the productivity above the subsistence level. Because if you can do that, then there's a margin for saving. Then all the good things that can happen, oh, then they invested in microfinance, then they added two cows, then they built a road, then they added a roof, then they brought electricity in. All those normal parts of positive development can take hold. So there's a dividing point in this logic, which is on one side of the divide you go down, and on the other side you go up. And mathematically, there's a dividing point. Where, and that's the nature of a poverty trap, if this is right, that there's a threshold. If you can invest beyond the threshold, then it's not a matter of continuing the investment, then the normal processes can take hold. So the investments we're trying to make are improving the soil nutrition, building long-lasting clinics, schools, bringing in electricity, which is a one-time investment, but then stays there afterwards, paving a road to connect the village, bringing in microfinance units and learning, that's a kind of human capital investment, so that we leave at the end of five years, but those things stay. The, we don't, we're not going to take the clinic back with us. And we're not taking the school back with us, and we're not taking the power lines back with us, we're not taking the road back with us, we're not taking the nitrogen in the soil back with us, we're not taking the nursery in which they've diversified the crops back with us. All of that stays. We go. That's the theory. What is the, there are several, so the general point that is made nine times out of ten, oh, that's just giving them money, but once they leave, you know, it all falls apart. That's happened a thousand times before, is a misunderstanding. It's just bad economics. And I wish those people would call me to discuss it before they write these articles. Because they waste your time, frankly. Uh, so at least he could have discussed the concept. But he didn't even know the concept. Because they think it's more interesting to attack than to place a phone call. Which is a little odd. Okay, that's academia. Um, <laughs> it is. Um, so... What are the real issues here? The real issues are first, is it really true that you can invest above the threshold? So is it really true that there are viable things for this community to do? Issue number one. You know, maybe it's just such a godforsaken place, it's impossible. Okay, that's issue number one. Issue number two, can you do it in five years? That's a good issue. Issue number three, do you know what you're doing? So even if there is something and you could do it in five years, have you made the right diagnosis together with the community? Issue number four is managerial sustainability. Because no matter, even if you put the road in and the power grid and the farming, you need actually to sustain those investments. Not the financial or the resource cost, but you know, being able to fix it if it breaks down, for example. So, and then is political sustainability. There has to be a political structure that the village doesn't go to war with itself, that it's able to govern the interventions. And finally, this has to be environmentally smart. If it's five years of further depleting the environment, but it's based on tapping groundwater that's just going to disappear, and we go away and then the, dr the, the well dries up, that's also bad. So there are about six definitions of sustainability that are valid. It's not easy to do this, but it's not like we don't think about it morning, noon, and night. It's not a new concept. It's actually the core of the concept. It's not the core, it's the second part. The core is raising productivity, and it's the insight that, you know, a bed net and a bag of fertilizer and 
uh, actually wireless internet and, and a cheap computer, that these things are now available as powerful technologies and that you can have powerful technologies that people don't use because they're too poor to adopt them. You need that mindset. You need to be able to understand that people can be watching their children die, know that they need a bed net, and yet can't afford it. That's the truth. I don't care how many critics say otherwise. I know that's true because I see it with my own eyes. And I'm trying to convey that. And then studies come out and they say, oh, that's true. They couldn't afford to buy it. But there's actually even a faster way. You look and you can learn some of these things. But it, I admit it's not as scientific. But it is. Actually, that's not even true. It is scientific to look carefully and to record and to describe. It's just not counted the same way. And it's got to be measurable and replicable. So the core concept is you can raise productivity. And then the second is, now, finally, on the, on the governance. We deal every day with the district officials. Not we, the villagers. They're there. We don't have anyone there. We're just advising the villagers. They're the ones living there and local people that are directing the project. Okay. So they deal all the time with the villagers. We can't take a step in the clinic, for example, without it being approved by the district health officer because this clinic is not an NGO clinic. It's a Ministry of Health clinic in every single Millennium Village. That's a point of principle. We can't do the road, the power, anything just because we have the money. Everything is with the local government. So the article got it completely wrong in terms of the substance of that, it, that this was a mystery. It got it right in asking some questions, which are the questions that need to be grappled with. And frankly, five years is a very quick period for this transformation. If the donors were, you know, easygoing and here's another billion, I'd have made it 10 years. But we are in such a difficult world of mobilizing resources that we went to the limit of the resources we could mobilize and we think that it's a close call but an achievable call to do this in five years. But it's not automatic. It's just that the naive way of that this is attacked, oh, that's fine, but that's just not sustainable, misunderstands that this question of sustainability is at the absolute center of the logic, the motivation, the strategy, the tactics. Whether we make it, we'll see. Please. So the, the question was uh, um, the general principle of opening up to trade is fine, but in practice, uh, Europe, for example, continues to subsidize its farmers, keep its markets closed, and in the end, politics will undermine the end of poverty. So good idea, but it ain't going to happen. Uh, because of, uh, of the politics, uh, if I could uh, put the gist of, of the question. Um, this is a very complicated subject. Um, so let me say just a, a couple of things about it, specifically about agriculture. Um, first, truly, surprisingly, most of Africa's problems most of the poor world's problems are not about trade barriers that they face. Just is not true. And if it were true, I'd be the first to want to say it. Uh, I'd have no hesitation in saying it, but it just isn't true. If I thought the way to 
get uh, Africa's needs met was through liberalization of European markets, I'd spend my time on that. I actually decided not to spend very much time on that. Not because I thought it, even because I thought politically it was hard, I just didn't think it was that strategic a way to, to proceed. Why do I say that? Because we actually have a pretty open world economy right now for most things. The fact that very poor countries and most African countries export only a small number of items, oil, gas, gold, copper, uh, uh, coffee, cocoa, tea, sisal, you know, maybe eight or nine, com iron ore, maybe eight or nine commodities, diamonds. The, the reason that you have a small number is that Africa is not competitive in the rest of the million items that can be traded. They just can't trade it. They can't produce and trade it. And that's true of almost all manufacturers. And one way that I think is important to see that is that during this last 25 years, China went from $20 billion a year of exports in 1980 to $800 billion of exports this past year in the same world market environment that Africa did no increase of manufactured exports to speak of. And Africa did not face any more barriers than China. It's just that China was competitive, Africa was not. Why? In my view, the main reason is that China had roads, electricity, uh, and uh, a number of other features, whereas Africa did not. And there's a lot of history, which I try to describe in the end of poverty, about why the environment is different, why the history has been different, and what to do about it. But in the end of the day, I feel that the problems of competitiveness are not trade barriers so much as the capital stock, whether it's of Sowery Village or the capital stock of Kenya. If you've been on the main road of Kenya from Mombasa to Nairobi to uh, Kisumu, it's a one road for millions and millions of people. It's the highway to the port, but it's a two-lane, pockmarked, impassable road much of the year. You just can't believe a country would depend on it. They're so poor, they can't get that thing built and sustained. And if I were, you know, it, if I were, I am, uh, advising the World Bank mainly as a pest, I tell them all the time, first thing, build, help them build a proper highway. Because until you do that, you can't get viable manufacturing going because the transport costs are so high, you actually can't sell the goods. And I went in Uganda with President Museveni a couple of years ago to the four textile exporters. China has tens of thousands. Dhaka, Bangladesh, has thousands of textile exporters. Uganda has four apparel exporters in, in Kampala. And I went to each CEO and said, what's your problem? The road. Because that's a landlocked country on the same road to Mombasa. But they can't transport, so they can barely stay alive. We went to a textile mill with the development minister of Tanzania uh, a few months ago. What did the, the planning minister ask the uh, CEO, what's your big problem? The road minister. So it's basic infrastructure. Now, there are a few commodities that are really uh, nasty in the policies, cotton being the number one. And that's the one always held out there. And it's horrible. My God, we've got 26,000 26, cotton farmers in the US pulling in $3 billion of subsidies. What a racket. Talk about corruption. It's disgusting. And it depresses the cotton price of Mali and, and Tanzania and Kenya and so forth. <laughs> but it is not the real issue of development. It's terrible. I want to end it, but you. It's important to reflect. Why have you heard the cotton story 50 times? Because there aren't 10 good stories. There aren't even five good stories. So what we really need to do is get roads, power, and, and then finally, one last point, on the real guts of the Doha round negotiations in agriculture, 
the issues are not about Africa. The issues about Argentina, Brazil, Chile, the US, Canada, Europe, South Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand. Why? Because the issues are about cereals. They're about wheat. They're about rice. They're about soybeans. They're about a uh, little bit about maize. But they're basically about staple exporters, which are the mid to high latitude countries with lots of land, not the African tropical savanna. So that's the, the you know, okay, I won't say more. Uh, Professor Sachs, there are dozens of questions that yes. you can see, um, and we have approached the end of our allotted time. Okay. So I want you to let the people who need to go go. And then, as long as you're willing to be here, I'm sure there'll be people asking questions. Thank you very much. Okay. We'll take uh, another. Uh, anyone can go anytime, but let's do five more minutes and then we'll wrap it up. Okay? Please. And speak, speak up, uh, please, for everybody. Um, you, you place a lot of emphasis on the correlation between demographic and uh, global power. Yes. Yeah, well, I think demographics uh, affects uh, the number of soldiers in the field. Uh, and that is, has been important. And I think it's actually important now uh, in this strange way in the shifting balance in the, in between the Middle East and Europe. Um, I don't think demographics is, I, when I basically think what's important for demographics, because I don't think we should uh, have population policies geared towards making soldiers for war. Uh, I think the main issue about demographics now is the, uh, the issues of environmental degradation and extreme poverty. Those, I think, are the most important demographic issues. I, what I was saying is that I do think that the relative numbers of population will change, and that will change to, within some margin politics within countries and, and even geopolitics. Africa will loom larger with 20% of the world's population than with 10. But if I were Africa, I'd try to stabilize at uh, 17 or 18%. Thank you very much. Because the issues of environment and poverty are really the predominant issues that count in this. And small can be beautiful in quality of life. None of this is about quality of life. In terms of quality of life, you know, sta a stable population uh, and uh, a, uh, leaving some margin of land and nature is definitely um, conducive to quality of life. So I didn't want to imply any sense of desirability of a population boom as a way to solve a geopolitical problem, quite the opposite. I think it's a very poor way to try to mobilize power the dominant finding is that these population bulges of large population growth and high fertility are destabilizing rather than stabilizing, and they work against uh, economic development also. Yes? Supposing Speak very loud so everyone can hear you. So how could more aid get into the hands of the extremely poor? The main way is very practical interventions of things and commodities directed at local needs. Bed nets, medicines, fertilizer, high yield seeds, clinic construction, and keep the experts, let experts go as volunteers on their spare time, not on our taxpayer budget if you had to allocate much less technical assistance and much more commodity support. That's what I would recommend. Of course, I'm not recommending keeping the aid budget where it is right now because we're spending, actually, I was going to show you a picture. That's our foreign policy in the United States. <laughs> you know, it's a lousy way to build security. And even Secretary Gates, our defense minister, our secretary of defense said 
in Kansas City last month, and I brought a quote. Hold on. What is clear to me is that there is a need for a dramatic increase in spending on the civilian instruments of national security. Diplomacy, strategic communications, foreign assistance, civic action, and economic construction and development, said Secretary Robert Gates. Good for him. Now, I am well aware that having a sitting Secretary of Defense travel halfway across the country to make a pitch to increase the budget of other agencies might fit into the category of man bites dog, or for some back in the Pentagon, blasphemy. It is certainly not an easy sell politically. And don't get me wrong, oops, I'll be asking for yet more money for defense. I didn't read that, oof. <laughs> How awful. We don't need more money for defense. We do not need more money for defense. Believe me, we don't. You know why? Because this picture is one year out of date. When CIPRI produces the next picture, the United States will be spending as much as all the rest of the world combined on the military. That's too much. So, Mr. Gates, we don't need more for defense. But you are right, we need more for diplomacy and development. So we shouldn't settle for the existing level we have. And I want people to understand that our total aid to Africa is $5 billion a year. Our total Christmas bonus on Wall Street last year was $24 billion a year. $24 billion of the Wall Street Christmas bonus. I'll show you one more thing. One more bit of magic. Two days Pentagon spending is $3.4 billion. We're spending $1.1 million a minute in the Pentagon. $1.1 million a minute. Economics for a crowded planet and the end of poverty, economic possibilities for our time. I'm delighted to see so many Dartmouth students in the audience today. Every Dartmouth student since the end of World War II has been confronted by the timeless quote from President John Sloan Dickey, the world's, pro the world's troubles are your troubles, and there is nothing wrong with the world that better human beings cannot fix. Born just eight years after those famous words were first uttered, there are very few people who embody them as well as our guests today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Andrew, it's nice to know what a wonderful thing came out of uh, Act 1430. <laughs> you, uh, in, uh, and it's a, a joy uh, to, to be here. Thank you to Dartmouth for the invitation and to the students for a great day all day. We've had some fantastic discussion already and I'm looking forward to more this evening, so I'm, I'm very, very grateful. And I, I love that uh, quotation uh, of uh, the, the uh, Dartmouth president because that's exactly uh, the point. These are solvable problems and they're actually not, they're, they're complicated but they're not that hard to, to solve. And when it comes to poverty, we actually have a lot of wind in the sails because it's a little weird to be in the year 2010 with all of the technology that we have, all of the capability, and still to have places in the world that are in extreme, extreme duress. In other words, if I were giving this talk in 1810, uh, it would be a kind of uh, dream talk, although there were some dreamers uh, of the Enlightenment who believed that the problems of human poverty, which had afflicted a human society forever and ever, could be solved. But here we are in 2010, and I find the question of ending poverty, uh, on, on the one side, really not so surprising. I just find it weird that there is still extreme poverty right now with all the tools that we have to do something about uh, these scourges. And in fact, a lot of my thinking has been to try to understand why it is 
that we still have places on the planet that in a way, and I use the metaphor frequently, are trapped in, in a poverty trap. It seems odd. It's not the normal situation in the world to be in extreme poverty. It's the exception now. It's, in fact, it's becoming more and more the exception, thank goodness. Economic growth works. Markets work. Technology does lead to human advance, though if it's used wrong, it can also lead to a lot of problems. But uh, some parts of the world, for complex reasons, have been stuck. And I want to explain a particular view of that that I've come to in my 30 years of work on this. It's not a view that was automatic or obvious for me. In fact, generally in my life, until I saw things with my own eyes, I didn't understand them. My imagination wasn't good enough. And economic theory has too many theories, by the way. Uh, they're all very clever. Uh, and uh, the hardest part about economic theory actually is not making a new theory, it's choosing among the hundred that exist to try to understand which ones are applicable at which times and in which places. And when I saw more and more of the world and saw more and more economic progress and contrasted it with places that were still stuck, that's when I began to develop some of the thinking that I have tried to employ and deploy during this past decade of the Millennium Development Goals. And those are the ideas that I want to share with you this evening. Why I think ending poverty isn't a matter of fate on the one hand. It's not a matter of what economists would call, you know, your differential equation system, which just tells you growth is going to do this and that to you. Or it's not the inevitable result of a market economy though market economy is necessary and it helps, but it is something that is within our grasp if we're clever about it. And from the point of view of the United States, well, we actually have a couple of paradoxes here. First, we have poverty in our midst that's very serious. And that's a social shame, and it's also unnecessary. And I'll come back to that later because we better reflect about the U.S. reality uh, as well as uh, the world's reality. The kind of poverty I'm talking about, though, is more extreme than the very real poverty that we have in the United States. I'm talking about the poverty that's so extreme that it is a matter of life and death survival for the poor, and where millions of very poor people die every year, not recognized by us, uh, nameless, without uh, headlines, uh, and not even attributed to poverty, but really deaths from poverty, from chronic undernourishment, from lack of access to an 80 cent dose of an anti-malaria medicine, uh, and so forth. That's the kind of poverty that I'm focused on. But the fact of the matter is, I don't want to give away punchlines, but the fact of the matter is we're not good in our own country at facing our own poverty. And it's not surprising that we're even worse at facing the rest of the world's poverty right now. We've kind of reached in our society a blind spot where we don't understand poverty anymore. We don't want to think about it. Our politicians don't use the terms. If you listen to President Obama or any of his uh, political opponents, all we have in this country is a middle class. Uh, we don't even want to mention poverty. And this is a barrier to our clear thinking about, uh, about these issues. And I want to try to clarify a few things uh, today. So this is the kind of poverty that um, I see very regularly. This is a place, and I'm going to describe uh, uh, this project in a little bit of detail, uh, one of the Millennium Villages, uh, which I think some of you have probably heard about. These are uh, parts, places within Africa where we're testing the proposition that I'm uh, going to speak about this evening, which is that targeted investments can break free, uh, can help communities to break free from the poverty trap. And this particular community where you see these uh, men digging a hole uh, is in Tigray province, Ethiopia. So it's in the northern province of Ethiopia on the Eritrean border. 
it's a dryland region, which is a first giveaway because being in a dryland uh, part of the world is almost a ticket to poverty, uh, except if you happen to have uh, oil under your dryland, uh, and then uh, it's quite different. But if you are dry and just scrub, uh, it's pretty tough life uh, and uh, not coincidental that there would be poverty. This day really shocked me because uh, we were uh, led out to this area where these men were digging and I was asked, do you know what they're doing? And if I did not know what they were doing and I didn't know what, uh, where we were exactly in the village. Uh, it turned out that this is a riverbed in the village, but the river has run dry. And it's run dry partly because of climate change, it seems, because the short rains in Tigray province uh, have become shorter or non-existent over the years, in recent years, seeming to be because of long-term climate change, though, of course, it's only after a much longer statistical record that you say, you nailed it. But it seems to be climate change. And population growth at the same time so more and more water taken out of the smaller and smaller trickle upstream. So that by the time you get to this village, there is no water in the dry season for eight or nine months out of the year. And the men were digging a hole in the middle of the riverbed to get to the water, and they had hired a pump out of the incredibly scarce resources, and they were going to pump the fields that day. But basically, this is a drought-prone, famine-prone, impoverished community and uh, the legs are thin and everyone's undernourished and uh, many hunger months a year. And we are working in this community among many places to try to end extreme poverty through targeted investments. And I have to tell you, when we drove here the first time, you uh, go to the regional capital and then you drive on a tarmac for about an hour. Uh, and then we turned off the tarmac into the bush uh, and drove for an hour. I didn't know that was still the road, actually, because it didn't seem to be the road, but there was a little bit of road. And then we turned one more time, and boom, 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 just rock, uh, not even uh, level, and went for another hour. And my colleague sitting next to me, who's a world-famous soil scientist, uh, was looking out desperate because there was no soil, it was sandy, it was rock. Uh, and he was just, you could see the sweat. <laughs> you know, what are we gonna do here? Uh, and we had given instructions to all of our colleagues around Africa in finding the Millennium Villages. We want hard places. This is to prove the hard stuff, not the easy stuff near the road. And he looked at me, said, this may be a village too far, one village too far. and. Uh, yet there's a tremendous amount of progress here. What you're seeing here is changing, actually, through proper landscape management and water harvesting at a landscape level, and I'll come back to talk about that in just a few minutes. This is another site that greeted us in another of the Millennium Villages when we started working in 2005 in western Kenya, and it is uh, a place that I describe in The End of Poverty. It was the first talk that I gave to a community when we launched this project, a uh, talk with the community, I should say, uh, a high AIDS prevalence part of Africa near Lake Victoria, a maize growing rural community, hungry, impoverished, uh, malarious, AIDS ridden, really tough. And uh, this is Yala Clinic uh, six years ago. Um, two patients to a bed, something I had never seen in my life. In Malawi, I saw three patients to a bed. These are not uh, people who know each other. These are strangers in an overwhelmed health facility. And they're infectious, too. So one may have TB, another may have AIDS. People are coming in a desperate state of affairs to the clinic. And the water bottle that you see under, or the 
jerry cans underneath are water brought by the patients' families themselves because there's no running water in these clinics. It's not like this anymore five years later, but this is a reality of what extreme poverty means, that even in a health facility, there's no water, which, by the way, is, cannot be a health facility uh, in those conditions. If a nurse or a doctor cannot wash hands between handling patients, the damage that can be done simply by transmitting the diseases is phenomenal. And you walk into a rural clinic in a rural village in a poor part of the world, and especially in sub-Saharan Africa, and the chance I always, first thing I do is I go to the tap and I turn it, and 90% of the time no water comes out, and then there's a quick excuse by the director of the facility, oh, we have water, but it's broken. It's been broken six years, maybe. Uh, but it's uh, an example of what extreme poverty is about. This is a puzzle, and the puzzle is a deep one. Why in a world where we have now 7 billion people living at an average output per person of $10,000 per capita, because that's what the world produces, a $70 trillion world product per year, and in which most of the world, I would say approximately uh, six-sevenths of the world, or maybe five-and-a-half-sevenths, that is 5.5 billion of the 7 billion people, are in some sense out of the extreme poverty trap. Why are there places that are stuck in extreme poverty? The, there is a mainstream view of this. And the mainstream view of this is that in some sense these places have themselves to blame. And typically the way we say it today is that uh, it's the fault of their governments. Governments are corrupt, mismanaged. That's why the people are in poverty. Uh, it used to be because of the color of their skin. It used to be because of their culture, although that's a latent view that is widely held. And I think that there is a, a general kind of uh, disdain and lack of seriousness, I would say, even within my profession, uh, often on these issues, that it's all blame. It's not really deep enough understanding. And frankly, I feel very fortunate that I've had a chance to work closely in these places now for 25 years, and it changed my understanding of everything as I got more and more engaged. So first piece of advice, if I could share advice with you, is go get engaged, see the world, get involved in problem solving. The books are great. What you learned is tremendously important, and it takes you maybe halfway to a truth. Uh, and uh, don't let it uh, ever pretend to take you more than a halfway, because until you see things with your own eyes, you simply can't get it. I had no idea what the AIDS pandemic was like. I had no idea what malaria was still doing in the late 20th century or early 21st century. And I really had no idea about the nature of extreme poverty also until seeing it. But one thing I can tell you without, uh, I, I actually want to show you some of the solutions, so I don't want to talk uh, at, uh, at too much length about uh, all of the, the diagnosis. But I had the experience pretty deeply over 25 years that the normal explanations that are given just don't sit right when you're actually looking at the problems close up. And the explanations are coming from 10,000 miles away, usually from Washington or even from our own economics departments, and they're just too far away from reality. And we miss very basic features. And the thing that drove me crazy is the basic premise of blame the victim one way or another, or blame the victim's government. Because I found over time that I was working with lots of governments. Most of them had corruption in them. And I would certainly include the United States in that mix, uh, quite a bit of corruption. And 
yet I couldn't find a moral ranking that these poor country governments were so much worse that that really explained it. In general, in poor countries, governance is worse in the sense that you don't have information systems, you don't have management, you don't have managers uh, with uh, high training and so forth. So there is a problem of poverty because governance costs money also. But the ranking of governments in poor countries, the ones growing and not growing, are not a moral ranking as one would sometimes pretend or imagine. And I had this funny experience when I was advising the Bolivian government and the Vietnamese government. The, Viet the Bolivian government at the time was actually much cleaner and it was uh, doing economic reform and the Vietnamese government was incredibly corrupt, one, <laughs> one party state. And Vietnam was booming. And Bolivia couldn't get an investment if it, uh, you know, gave it away. And it wasn't completely a surprise. Bolivia was at 12,000 feet above sea level in the Altiplano, not so easy to get to, among the highest transport costs in the world, not a great place to make television sets or electronics. Whereas Vietnam was right there with this marvelous coast where the Taiwanese or the Koreans or the Japanese could make a fortune with low-cost labor in a coastal enterprise near a port in the uh, Asian uh, trade sea lanes for export to the United States. So factory after factory was going up, and the uh, commissars were getting their cut. But it didn't matter. It was highly profitable. So I said, you know, it's not just the ranking of corruption, thank you. It actually matters if you're landlocked high in the Andes Mountains or if you're coastal near the booming emerging economies, and so on and so on and so on. The main point is pay attention to the realities of the economics. Look at the costs, look at the possibilities, look at the resources. If you're in a dry land and the drought comes every three years, it's really tough to have enough food to eat and to have food security. And don't blame that on governance. And if the rains fail more, the only governance that's really failing is our own because we're creating the climate change that's causing more and more of these crises. So it becomes a little bit more complicated when you get from the blame stage to the problem solving stage. And when you're assigned the task not of diagnosing the problem only or writing a good paper about it, but actually trying to solve it. And then you say, oh, God, but the governance is OK. That can't be the problem. What's happening here? Why? Oh, there's no road. I forgot. Oh, there's no electricity. Oh, there's drought. Hmm, now what are we going to do about that? Well, we should build the road. Hmm, how are we going to pay for that? No money? Why is there no money? Well, because everyone's impoverished. And you start to see that you've got problems that are a little bit more complicated and more engaged. So I came to a view 20 years ago that we had to crack a set of interconnected forces in very poor places that were quite complicated. Poverty trap, I believe, is a useful metaphor. What does it really mean? It means a place that's an extreme impoverishment as its initial condition. Typically, it can hardly stay alive reliably, meaning that infant mortality rates, child mortality rates are high, maternal mortality rates are high, life expectancy is low, undernutrition is rampant, children drop out of school early. It's a lot of the poorest parts of the world, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. So saving is low or negative because you can't even survive on your current income, much less save from it. Negative saving means that you're running down your natural capital, for example, your local resources, you're cutting down trees for charcoal, you're depleting soil nutrients, you're mining the groundwater because that's what you use in pumping for your irrigation if you're lucky enough to have that. So the saving isn't even zero, it's negative. And typically, there are many forces of disarray. Population growth is very high. Unless there's family planning and contraceptive availability, 
in a poor place, population fertility rates will be six or seven. And that means a population doubling every generation. And that's happening in the poorest countries, already in conditions of environmental distress. Climate change, environmental degradation of deforestation, soil nutrient depletion, land uh, degradation. Inevitably poor governance, but as an outcome, not as a primary cause. You can't govern when you can't tax and you can't pay a proper civil service, you can't pay your judges, you can't pay your police, you can't invest in information systems and so forth. And when you really reach the end of the line, conflict. The probabilities of violence and conflict are vastly higher in poor places than in middle income places. And this is causal from poverty to conflict. And recent papers have shown, for example, that in very poor areas of Africa, when the rains fail, the probability of onset of conflict rises three or four or five times. And so you have an instrumental variable for the econometricians in the room, and that is the rainfall that's showing the causations running from the poverty to the conflict rather than the other way around. Now, my thought has been that the way to break the poverty trap is through investment in a diversified set of high return areas. Infrastructure, roads, power, uh, water and sanitation, internet connectivity, mobile phone connectivity, all crucial for basic business development now. Second, of course, is human capital. And human capital means a safe childbirth, in fact, safe intrauterine development of, uh, of the fetus, safe childbirth, nutrition, and schooling. And so it's early childhood development giving a chance for a child to grow to be a productive uh, and a fully developed uh, member of, of the society. And, of course, there is the social capital that needs development, whether it's the trust or the political institutions and so forth. But it is to invest, to build a capital base that is adequate for self-sustaining growth. What does self-sustaining growth mean? Self-sustaining growth means, like most of the world, that you have enough income that you can save, invest in intellectual capital and human capital and physical capital and business capital and infrastructure capital to keep an endogenous growth dynamic going. And that's possible. What's happening in the U.S.? Ah, we forgot to save. Uh, we started consuming so much that we actually ended up uh, not saving, even though we're the richest major country in the world. We're pretty miserable savers uh, these days, and it finally hit the wall that uh, our low saving uh, created a financial crisis and so on. That's not intrinsic to us, it's just a little too much consumerism uh, and uh, a little too little saving for our future. Uh, and now massive budget deficits, which is another form of dissaving. But once you have a kind of income, even $2,000 per capita, not 46000 like the U.S. has, you have enough to save. And that can lead to self-sustaining growth. So the idea of breaking the poverty trap is to lay the base to raise productivity enough to get out of the trap. In the end of poverty, I call it getting on the first rung of the ladder of development. Because once you're on the ladder, you can climb. But if you can't reach the ladder, you can't move forward. This concept, I believe, is correct, obviously, because I go on about it incessantly. But it's not so easily understood, apparently. Or maybe it's not right, but I think it is. Uh, because uh, I'm constantly asked, well, you know, what about dependency and endless aid and so forth? So you don't get it. The whole purpose of the aid is to get off the dependency. Because if you give development assistance not as a handout of food, that's a bad idea except if somebody's starving. 
but it certainly allows the long-term answer. But if you give the development assistance as investment and a, at a sufficient scale to actually reach the threshold where self-sustaining growth can take hold, you end the need for aid. I'm known as someone who loves aid. I detest aid. I want to be done with it. But you can't be done with it if you trickle it out in sub-therapeutic doses so that the country never gets better. You actually have to solve the problem. Then you can be done with it. And then you can, we could graduate from this era where even those transfers are needed. Now, mind you, in, when poverty is regional within your own country, there are two things that normally happen that are very important. One is migration. People leave the impoverished area and go to the wealthier areas. Second is regional policy, investing from the richer areas to the poorer areas to break the poverty trap. So generally, if you're within a country and you have an impoverished region, maybe geographically distressed, and a booming region, the country will take care of itself through these mechanisms of market forces, basically. But if you're just impoverished all by yourself and you're stuck in the poverty trap, someone better come to help you. That rankles a lot of my fellow economists because the game is you got to get out of this on your own. I'm not sure why in a rich world that's the game when people are dying by the millions. So I'd rather do the little bit of help to break the poverty trap than to try to figure out the absolutely ingenious way for poor people to be able to survive on their own. And that's what I've been trying to say. So at risk of uh, taking us a little bit of a detour, I just want to give you the flavor of the formalism, because this is an academic uh, in engagement. And I want to explain formally, just for a couple of minutes, how this works. So imagine a millennium village. And it starts out that the out subsistence, what you need to survive is 300 bucks, but you need to survive reliably. But the community is living at 200 bucks. And you ask, how can that be? And the answer is a lot of people die. And that's how life really is in impoverished places. Doesn't mean everybody dies. It means that one out of every five children die before their fifth birthday or it means that one out of every hundred childbirths, the mother dies. So you're at $200 sub-subsistence. Saving is zero because you can't even reach subsistence. But let's assume that a poor family will save a lot, actually, for its future once it's beyond subsistence, like Chinese households. Now, suppose also that if you can get your hands on fertilizer, for example, each dollar of input gives $2.50 of output. You say, well, that's crazy. What kind of return is that? That's the actual return that you can get in many parts of Africa for using fertilizer. Well, why don't they use fertilizer? Because you can't afford it. You're starving. Poor people can't get it, don't know it. They don't constitute a market. And you say, no, Sachs, you must be crazy. But just look at the actual results, not at what I'm telling you. Farm families in Africa do not use fertilizer, except in the cash crop plantation areas, because they're too poor. And there's actually a 1,000 papers on that point, too. But it's surprising, because the returns are quite high. But there's no financing. So. And there's no financing because the contracts are also damn hard to enforce with impoverished people. So if you can save because you're above the $300 threshold, then you devote it to agriculture up to the maximum. And then after that, you devote it to other kinds of capital improvements on your farm beyond fertilizer. Maybe you buy a cow. Maybe you buy chickens. Maybe you buy a chicken coop. Maybe you do more irrigation and so on. What's the implication of this kind of poverty trap? If no one comes to help you, you remain at $200 per capita forever. You can't buy the fertilizer. You can't invest in it. 
You just go along plotting, and that's how uh, hundreds of millions of people live year in, year out. Really shocking. If you are given targeted aid for fertilizer, it raises your output. If you're given enough targeted aid, it raises your output above $300, and you start to save. If you are given help long enough, five years, four years, so that your saving becomes big enough that it can now buy fertilizer at the beginning of the season out of self-financing, get the bigger yield, sell it, and get an even larger amount of income afterwards, you've made it. And so the point is that in this kind of setting, the following happens, purely theoretical. Three scenarios. One is no one gives you help. Second, you get help for two years. And third, you get help for four years. So in the no help scenario, your ODA, that's official development assistance. We don't know that term in America because we don't do any of it, almost. So here are the three models. The blue is no aid ever. The red is, OK, a one year or two years of $75 of aid going down to zero. And then the third is three years of $75 aid going down to 60 and then going down to zero. That's just the little illustration. What happens in these three scenarios? Income in the no aid scenario is trapped at zero forever. Income in the two years of aid is that you jump up, you get a little bit of saving, but it's not enough to get you out of the poverty trap. And when the aid is cut off, you come crashing back down to subsistence after a couple of years. If aid is four years adequate, the green line takes hold. And that is that after four years, you're on your own. You don't have to look back. You don't need any more assistance. You've made it. You've broken free of the poverty trap. Why is that? Because you've reached a level of saving that you can self-finance the inputs each year to be above subsistence, to have a surplus to save for the future, to make more investments. You've gotten out of the trap. That's my point. If we do a little bit, but just enough, it can't be too little, because that's like giving a sub-therapeutic dose of medicine. You don't solve the problem. If you give enough, it's temporary. And then real market growth, the stuff that applies to six-sevenths of the world, then applies to the last one-seventh of the world. Let's help make that last step out. And I've spent now 10 years intensively trying to estimate the costs of what's really needed. It's an unusual approach. It's so micro, it's more micro than micro. Because it's really asking, what do you need for the health system? What does it cost for those community health workers, for that clinical officer, for that medical officer, for the electricity in the place? What is the unit cost? How much is the ambulance? I find that good economics, by the way. My colleagues have their doubts sometimes. It's so intricate, but actually that's how to solve problems in my view, is to be very specific, very targeted, and to try to figure out what is that therapeutic dose that is enough to break the poverty trap. And the way we're doing this specifically is in the Millennium Villages. So the idea of the Millennium Villages is to actually make these targeted investments in what are now about 15 sites around Africa, in all of the major agroecological zones. So what's it like in the rainforest? What's it like in the Ethiopian highlands? What's it like in the uh, drylands of uh, northeast Kenya? What's it like in the bimodal uh, uh, maize growing area of western Kenya? What's it like in the unimodal uh, maize growing area of Tanzania, and so on? because ecology matters a lot. What does it take in each place to get out of the mess? It takes more in the drylands, I can tell you. 
because you have to pay for irrigation. You have to pay for other things that you don't need necessarily in the other locations. So you want to find out specifically what's involved. Africa is a very, very big continent, so doing this in one place or another wouldn't be sufficient. Today somebody sent me this map by coincidence stressing how big Africa is. You see China snuggles into South Af Southern Africa, the United States into West Africa, India into the Horn of Africa. This is a very big continent. That's drawn to proper scale. So you can fit China, India, the United States, and Western Europe into Africa uh, and still have a little space left over. And uh, the point is that's why we're operating all over the continent in order to be able to understand, of course, also cultural and governance differences, but also ma mainly ecological differences. The idea is to achieve the Millennium Development Goals in Africa, the eight goals, but mainly the focus on health, nutrition, uh, schooling, and income, which are, and basic infrastructure, which constitute the objectives of the Millennium Development Goals. And this will be, I'll leave the PowerPoint for uh, uh, Rockefeller Center so everybody can uh, look at it afterwards in, in detail. The five main interventions are agriculture, health, education, infrastructure, and business development. The idea is to make that base so that a few years of targeted investments can create a capital platform on which self-sustaining growth can take hold. It's actually a 10-year project. The first five years are devoted to the most basic uh, systems building. The second five years, which are starting now, are devoted to the business investment in agriculture. So we're bringing in loans now rather than grants against the business opportunities. And there are specific interventions. That's the point. It's not just a general idea, do nice things. It's actually target the kinds of investments that have been shown through decades of both experimentation and actual life to yield high returns, whether it's fertilizer, high yield seeds, treadle pumps, agricultural extension services in the upper left hand corner, uh, whether in infrastructure, it's cell phone coverage, internet connectivity in schools, road grading, uh, and so on in the lower right hand corner. Uh, that's hard to see, but you'll see it when you look more closely. Again, a list of very specific interventions in the health sector, for example. We have a large health team on the ground. No expatriates actually doing anything. It's all village-based, though expatriates are part, or not just expatriates. I mean, it's an international advisory group, but it's all locally implemented because the idea is this is for village development on their own. It's not for parachuting in somebody to do something, it's for the communities to find their own way out. And the key is very structured systems building. So you think about in an organized way what kinds of public investments need to be made to get the roads and the power built, what kinds of investments need to be made to help farmers grow more uh, food, how to build the schools, the classrooms, and uh, get uh, the quality of education improved through internet connectivity and so on. And so there's a series of timelines in key areas over the first five years and, and a similar kind of uh, series of timelines in the second five years. And there's a specific budget. This is a hypothesis based on the UN Millennium Project work for Kofi Annan, which tried to identify the costs of the targeted investments that would be needed. We came up with an estimate of $120 per person per year in the villages. And the theory of the project is that if half of that can be brought from the outside, then half can be mobilized locally. And together, a $120 per person per year investment carried out over five years, will build the basic 
capital structure of a self-sustaining community. The second five years, which is less money, about $35 coming from the outside, is to build the business infrastructure, farmer cooperatives, uh, nurseries, storage facilities, transport hubs, and so on. And that's the work that's going on right now. So this is a, now where does $60 fit into the scheme of things? If the world were to give $60 per capita in investment, not in handouts, but in investment, to the billion impoverished people, that would be $60 billion a year. The rich world GNP is about $35 trillion to $40 trillion a year, depending on the exchange rate and whether we're having a good year. So 1% of $35 trillion is $350 billion, actually. $60 billion is a tiny fraction of that. It's, you could say, two-tenths of 1% of the rich world GNP. And mind you, another way to think about it is uh, 60 billion a year uh, for covering $60 per capita for a billion people. We're spending 100 billion this year in Afghanistan. Bombing people, by the way. Not helping anybody, as far as I can see. So this is a modest amount of money compared to the wealth of the rich world and the kinds of investments that we are making in other ways that I think are less salubrious. That's a hard slide to read. That one's a little easier. This shows, as an example, the change of crop yields. This is the decisive engine of potential growth, or I should say potential engine of growth, for rural Africa is raising agricultural productivity. And there's a great benefit to be had because there's a high return waiting to be taken that isn't taken because capital markets don't work in this impoverished setting. And so there is a high return to putting seed and fertilizer into the ground. And you get a move from about one ton per hectare yield of maize, for example, corn, to three tons per hectare even in the very basic conditions. Mind you, in U.S. farms, you get 10 tons per hectare. And if you can bring in irrigation, you get double cropping, so you could get 20 tons per hectare. So we're just at the beginning of what's potentially the large increase of productivity. But if you're impoverished and doing traditional farming, you're stuck in hunger at one ton per hectare. And what this shows, the blue is where we started, and the red is where we are right now. And basically, there's been a three to fourfold improvement of productivity. That means income, because each ton is $200 per ton of income for the farmer. So it's another $600 per farm family, for example, that has come for a hectare farm. And many, many other targeted improvements have the same dynamic. If you invest, you get high returns. That's the basic point. If it's giving a bed net to a household to protect the household from malaria, the returns are phenomenal because the bed net costs five bucks. It lasts five years, sleeps two children, 50 cents per child, and it saves a lot of lives. And yet, Poor families are too poor to have it on their own. This is an example of, well, this is just a, another uh, slide showing that the institutional deliveries, safe childbirth, go up, of course, when you have a clinic that can provide safe delivery. Uh, this is the rate of utilization of uh, clinics. It's visits per person per year on average in this Ugandan Millennium Village. What's the point? The point is they drop the user charges for coming to the clinic, and that allowed poor people to go use services. And that's also shown in this upper graph where this Ghana facility, which was collecting something like 50 cents or a dollar per visit to the clinic, 
we supplied a subsidy to allow free access and the use of the health facilities essentially tripled. And for impoverished people, that's a difference of life and death. So many, many improvements are possible in short order. In health, you can bring down mortality rates from 200 deaths of children under five per thousand live births to, I believe, around 30 within a period of a few years. That's what we're aiming for. We're probably down from 150 to 200 now, down to about 75 per thousand because of the first five years, but the trend is sharply down. Just let me give you one example. We just trained and introduced a new method for neonatal resuscitation. About 35% of deaths now are neonatal deaths within the first 28 days. Most of those are within the first day of birth. And a large proportion of those are within the first minutes of birth. Babies sometimes don't start breathing on their own. Turns out a little plastic squeegee and a little bit of training is enough to get a huge rate of neonatal resuscitation. That's all it takes. Clear the airways and a few other protocols. And this is uh, a, something developed and now being spread by the American Pediatrics Association. And its program is called Helping Babies Breathe. It's not done anywhere. So we started this in one of the uh, villages just as a trial about six months ago. I don't remember which one it is, but we just got the report yesterday. An incredible number of lives being saved, of uh, neonates being saved in the first six months. Start out zero, then there were seven resuscitations, and then 20 resuscitations, and the curve went like this, and now like a, uh, a sigmoidal curve, it's leveled off. So we've really been able to reach with almost no expense at all, a huge improvement, and we talked today how to strategize to make sure that it now reaches all the Millennium Villages across the continent because the health ministers come and then they see and then they say, oh, I get it, we can do that. So there are so many of these things that can be done at low cost. The problem, the damn problem, is they can't be done at zero cost. I don't know if someone will be ingenious to get it from $60 to $20. I can't. This is already squeezing to the bone for us. But that's such a little amount of money in the scheme of things that our governments ought to be running to produce massive yields uh, like here in Malawi. Or this is now training community health workers, a new concept, not new. The barefoot doctors in China did this 40 years ago. But trained, properly trained and salaried community health workers is a boom in the Millennium Villages and in parts of Africa that can afford this right now. These are my favorite uh, bed nets uh, in distribution in, in Western Kenya. Uh, this is simply now with wireless broadband available increasingly. You're able to get schools that couldn't even imagine this online now. You put up a couple solar panels. These computers are down to 150 or $200. Uh, cost, of course, you need local management and, and protection that they're not stolen and, and, uh, and fixing things and so on. So it's not zero cost, but it's absolutely feasible at low cost. And of course, safe drinking water with protected uh, springs or piped water as we're doing. And another wonderful basic intervention, school feeding programs, changes life. Because if the children are eating in the midday, they're attentive, they're coming to school, their parents are sending them to school, they're healthier, and the benefits for education, for attendance, for nutrition are tremendous. And we're, we've introduced this, of course, across all of the Millennium Villages. So, remember the goals. I didn't remember that that slide did that. Uh, these are all targetable through basic investments. 
And for middle income countries, they're all affordable out of their own resources. I do not lobby for aid. I don't lobby anyway, but I don't uh, advocate for aid for Brazil or for Mexico or for Malaysia. They can do it on their own, thank you. It's for the poor countries that can't do it on their own that we need to be giving help. It's not distribution, redistribution for redistribution's sake in my mind. It's to build the base of self-sustaining communities. Since about seven out of the nine million children who die every year before their fifth birthday are in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, that's where we need to target the development assistance. And there has been some good news. This is the curve of showing the development aid for health during the past decade. And that's in constant uh, inflation corrected prices. But the estimates of need are not 10, but closer to 35. So we started out a tenth of where we needed to be. Now we're probably close to half if you were to extend this to 2010. There's been real progress in getting closer. President Bush made a major advance with three things, with PEPFAR for AIDS, with the President's Malaria Initiative, and with supporting the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria. Unfortunately, we stopped there and didn't invest enough in other kinds of interventions, and very little, basically nothing new has happened during the Obama presidency so far. Now, here is the truth and the kind of the crying shame. This is aid as a share of gross national product. It's the aid relative to capacity. And there is an international norm, UN Target established 40 years ago, that countries should get, give 0.7 of 1% of their national income and development assistance. That means 70 cents per $100 of GNP. And five wonderful countries do it. The Nordic countries, basically. Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Netherlands, Luxembourg. They're the ones on the far left above the top line. Then there's a middle group. Average effort is about 0.47 of 1% of GNP. And whoa, where do we find the United States? Ouch! We are the lowest. Actually, we're no longer the lowest. Greece slipped below us this past year <laughs> in the middle of their financial crisis. That's the US. 20 cents out of $100. We're a country spending $5 out of $100 for the military and 20 cents out of $100 for development assistance. In my view, it's foolhardy, foolhardy. It can't make foreign policy work. And if you read, as I just did, Woodward's book on uh, the Afghanistan war, you'll go 300 pages and not see one sentence, at least maybe I missed it, about development in Afghanistan. It's all generals talking, who to bomb and how many soldiers. It's completely reckless and naive because Afghanistan's one of those landlocked, impoverished countries that doesn't have roads, doesn't have power, doesn't have water, doesn't have irrigation. It's trapped in extreme poverty. It's war ravaged. It lacks infrastructure, lacks transport. When that happens, the only thing that moves is high value per unit weight, also known as poppy and heroin. That's the nature of trade in a place that doesn't have roads. The stuff that you can afford to take out. But try taking out fruits that need to be properly refrigerated and stored and depots and quality for, it's, it's impossible unless we do some development. So I don't know what they're thinking when they talk about the hearts and minds of winning the hearts and minds in this counterinsurgency. It's fantasy land. They don't know anything about the hearts and minds of the Afghan people, nor did they even think to ask. And they called that the strategy. And that's $100 billion of our money. 
And then we turn around and we can't find one extra billion dollars for the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria at last week's replenishment conference. So this is what I call our choices for America. This is how it stands right now. This is defense, definitely a euphemism because we also do offense. <laughs> this is development aid, and that's diplomacy. Those are what's called the three pillars of U.S. foreign policy. And God, if you are an architect trying to put a roof over those three pillars, it's preposterous. So don't let anyone tell you we can't afford it. We can't afford not to do this. This is completely misguided American policy. This is a little out of date because it comes from the end of, well, it does come from the end of poverty. No, I guess it was updated. Two days Pentagon spending, then it would now be higher. Let's say 700. Yeah, it'd be nearly $4 billion. It's now nearly $2 billion a day. So it'd be $4 billion. All of malaria control for all of Africa for a year is $3 billion. So it's less than two days military spending. That's all the bed nets needed for Africa for five years. And that's the malaria budget. And that part hasn't changed. So this is really, really messed up. And I have a campaign going to get the Pentagon to take off next Thursday and Friday. <laughs> Just two days. Nothing's going to happen. And then we could actually control malaria all through Africa comprehensively, just on that alone. And turns out where we're fighting is impoverished drylands. Because the yellow areas are the drylands and the red cones are the violent places. And the overlap is very uh, marked and very clear. And I can tell you it's no accident. When I was in Yemen five years ago, I came back from the trip. I was invited by President Saleh to see the huge challenges in Yemen and came back shocked. Went to Washington, said this place is sliding into absolute violence. Of course, no one cared. Yemen, what's that? That's one of 192 countries on a list. And five years later, we've got a massive military effort chasing al-Qaeda all around Yemen, which is another fool's errand, because if we chase them out of Yemen, they'll go someplace else. If you want to secure a place to be safe, it has to have basic governance, and it has to have a basic means of life. And Yemen already five years ago clearly didn't. Somalia doesn't. The drylands in the Horn of Africa do not. Afghanistan does not. And yet we pose these problems as military problems, not as development problems. We're just not good at thinking this through right now. I think the economics is part of it, and I think that uh, close diagnosis and detailed analysis and deploying the models and theories that we have, because poverty traps are a core part of economic development thinking, but like many things, they're one of 20 models, so they work in some times and they don't work other times, and so proper model choice is, needs absolute rigorous engagement with reality. But we have another problem, which is even when we know it, we don't want to know it. We don't want to face it. We're missing a lot of truths in our own country right now. We haven't saved for years. We borrowed like crazy. As soon as we stopped borrowing, we started borrowing again through stimulus. Wrong idea, in my opinion, after you have uh, overconsumed 
for 20 years to just amplify that through budget deficits didn't make sense to me because we're not thinking for the longer term and we're not investing for the longer term right now. And economic progress depends fundamentally on saving and investment and on a rich saving and investment, saving on uh, an investment not only in physical capital but in infrastructure, in securing the environment, in breaking poverty traps, in creating social trust, in building new technologies. You have to think ahead. And if we don't think ahead, we can't make it. And we have to think like a community. And we're not good at thinking like a community. Our country almost doesn't have a society right now. It's just pulling itself apart. Anti-immigrant, racial divisions again, it's quite striking and shocking. And it's all being, I think, amplified by a lot of propaganda, by a lot of high-income in, uh, high campaign contributors and corporations who just want nothing except their taxes cut. Damn the future, damn the country, damn the budget. They just want their taxes low and everybody else can be damned. And it's a disaster. And at a global level, we're, of course, sliding into more hate. Now, China is our bugaboo. That's going to be with us for a while because they're going to keep gaining on us, believe me. But that's OK. That's progress if we treat it right. It's only neurosis and angst if we misunderstand it. And we're not good at that, and we're not good at understanding the nature of society. The places where I'm working, I want to tell you, they're racially different, ethnically different, religious difference, everything. I've never for once had a moment of less than hospitality, partnership, collegiality, problem-solving, mutual respect in all the work. It transcends every line because once you get down to business of working together, it's just a pleasure, first of all. It's exciting. It's exhilarating. And all of these divisions of Muslim this and Christian that and so forth are meaningless, and they go away immediately, actually. And we're just not good at understanding that either. And if we took a different approach, so many of these problems would melt away. Not everyone, and I'm not saying to dissolve the army and that we don't need uh, defense. I'm saying pay attention to human beings on the other side. Because they want their children to survive. They want their children to be in school. They want to have water that isn't going to kill them with pathogens. They don't want to die from a mosquito bite. They don't want their wives and mothers and daughters dying in childbirth because there isn't an ability to deliver the placenta or to stop hemorrhaging, which is as low cost as can be. It's just human beings on the other side. And it's not that everybody's so corrupt that they're out to kill their own people, and so you can't get bed nets to populations or you can't get emergency obstetrical care. It's just nothing like that. That's just convenient things for people in Washington to say who know nothing. And that nothing is, that's a real line I'm talking about. Because they've got power and they have, they're irresponsible. And they're not trying to find out. And they're talking to the wrong people. Maybe they've lost the ability to find out, but they're not really finding out. So we need a global ethic to understand that we have a united society. And I just about always close by uh, pointing out maybe uh, a deep tang of my upbringing, uh, John Kennedy, who in 1963 used the philosophy of a common approach to solve the greatest problem of his era, and that was to put some break on the madness of the nuclear arms race that had almost led to complete destruction in the October 1962 missile crisis. And Kennedy said, 
this is madness. It's actually people on both sides. And we've got to find a way back from the brink. And his last year of presidency before he was assassinated, in my view, was the finest year of an American president's leadership in the, certainly in the post-war world, because he campaigned for peace. And he gave a great speech in June 1963 called the Peace Speech now. It was the American University Commencement Address, June 10, 1963. It's online. You should listen to it. It's absolutely beautiful. It's magnificent. And it was a speech about making peace with Soviet Union. And I love it because it would be as hard as, you know, Obama talking about making peace with our biggest enemies right now. Uh, and Kennedy was scared politically. He didn't even show it to many of his advisors because he thought they would stop him from making the speech. But it wasn't a speech telling the Soviets, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this, and then we can have peace. It was a speech telling the Americans, we got to rethink what we're doing because our attitudes are as essential as their attitudes if we're going to have peace. Absolutely a remarkable insight, crucial. It's called empathy. And we don't have it very often. But he had it, and he gave this marvelous speech. And when he gave it, Khrushchev heard it, said that is the finest speech by an American president since FDR was exactly what Khrushchev told Avril Harriman, the US envoy, in Moscow. And five weeks later, they signed the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which was the first stop of the Cold War escalation. And I think it changed the direction of history. And it was an act of ethical imagination, in my opinion, as much as statecraft. It was ethics, because ethics is basically uh, elaborated empathy. It's the ability to see things through somebody else's eyes and take seriously the implications of that. And Kennedy said in the speech my favorite words, which I like to end on, because I think that they capture the essence of what we're after. So let us not be blind to our differences, but let us also direct attention to our common interests and the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air, we all cherish our children's futures, and we are all mortal. Thank you very much. I filibustered a long time, and you were very, very patient. Um, why don't we take a few questions uh, in, uh, and, uh, or comments? By the way, I, I welcome comments as much as questions, uh, as long as they're relatively brief. If there are questions, please. Um, so I was wondering how much I, oh, sorry. We have, a, we have roving mics. Why don't we start here, and then a mic will come uh, to you next. Thank you so much. My name is Kate Pekoski. I'm the volunteer coordinator here at the Tucker Foundation. Um, you spoke a lot about agricultural um, investments and investing in high, kind of high input agriculture. And I wonder how you respond. I, I imagine you've received um, criticisms from people that, that champion sustainable agriculture. And how do you respond to them when they say um, high input agriculture not only is an an ecological degradation of some sorts, and on how do you respond when they talk about kind of this, the cyclical trap of investing in high yield seeds and fertilizers when you're kind of indebted to a Monsanto, for example, for so long? I would love to hear you speak about that. Yeah. So, so basically, uh, everything has its uh, proportions, uh, and being at one ton per hectare where Africa is, which is the ultimate organic farming, if I could put it that way because there is, it's, it's not uh, high productivity organic farming, but it's all organic because there's nothing, no chemical fertilizer used, uh, has left a continent in the deepest hunger. All the rest of the world uses chemical fertilizers. 
because there's a basic budget of nitrogen that is fundamental for life, for us, and for the plants. And the basic budget is that if the nitrogen is not adequate in the soil, the plant can't grow. And if the plant can't grow, of course, you get a hungry population. And think about it that most soils in, in nature start out with an adequate level of nitrogen, but then each crop you take takes the nitrogen out. It has to be replenished. There are basically two kinds of replenishment. One is inorganic fertilizer, and the other is organics, compost and so forth. Both can do because it's the same nitrogen. The yield from organic is much lower if you take into account all the land you need to get the, the, uh, either the composting, the green crop, or the manure uh, of the animal that you've been feeding to uh, provide the, uh, the, the manure. If you graze a cow in a nitrogen deficient area in Africa, by the way, its manure is nitrogen deficient also, by the way, so you don't get very much fertilizer out of it. So there is a basic nitrogen budget. It's also the case, not well understood, that if you put compost and green manure and so forth in a heavy investment in organic farming, you get nitrogen runoff the same way, even more. So the eutrophication problems and the nitrates and so forth, this isn't just from chemical fertilizer. It is actually from organics as well. We have a basic problem, which is that 7 billion people is really a tough load to feed on the planet. And the only way we're even coming close to doing it right now, and actually you could say, ironically, the only way we got to 7 billion also, is by the discovery of fixing atmospheric nitrogen in urea-based fertilizer, which happened around 1910. That brought us to where we are today. If you don't replenish the soils in Africa, you can't, uh, you can't escape from poverty from hunger and from disease. So you need to get massive amounts of nitrogen in the soil. The chemical fertilizer approach, by the way, has to be combined with organics anyway. You have to leave crop residues and build up a natural carbon uh, richness in, in the soil as part of good farming, period. But you can't do it without that dosing of uh, chemical fertilizer. What's important to understand, though, also, is that if you start in a nitrogen-deficient environment, adding nitrogen at the doses we're doing, say 50 kilo or 100 kilo per hectare, is not an overload. In fact, it basically is replenishment of what's missing right now. If you do it with micro-dosing and, and uh, techniques, you use a little uh, Coke uh, bottle cap and put it into each seed hole, you can actually get more for uh, the, the minimum. You get a big response and you get less runoff and so forth. So that's also good farm practices are important. But simply trying to do without this or thinking somehow I'm going to do it organically doesn't work. So you need the boost. That's number one. Second, the income uh, advantage is enormous. And so it really pays. It helps people lift out of poverty. Third. It's not pesticides and long-lasting herbicides and other chemicals. We're not doing that, by the way. We're using integrated pest management in organic approaches because the management of those chemicals is quite dangerous and it leads to a lot of toxicity for the farmers. That's completely different from a uh, diammonium phosphate fertilizer, for example, or a bag of urea. So there's a make a big difference between the pesticides, especially the persistent pesticides, and fertilizer, totally different in their ecological consequences. Finally is the seed issue. The seed issue is very basic, which is that you can't get a high yield on, a, on, on the farmer's own seed. You need seed breeding. You need to buy the seed from someplace. And all high yield yields around the world, three tons, four tons, five tons, 10 tons, 20 tons, are improved commercial seeds. 
that's okay if you can afford it. And it's not just Monsanto, by the way. There's Western Seed Company and many, many seed producers that are producing high-yield seeds. But there's a huge difference of using your own seed, which even with fertilizer won't have a response, and using these high-yield varieties, the kind that brought the Green Revolution in the first place. Nothing is for free, though. There are ecological risks to any place humans are acting, and intensification raises those risks, for sure. Because in India, we're seeing water problems now of groundwater depletion, for example. So you have to go into this in a methodical way to understand what is sustainable. But the low input, uh, low intensification is what is already there right now. This is organic. And it's a disaster, a human disaster right now. And it's the highest hunger on the planet. So I'm not so worried about these things compared to the current situation. But I have to say, we haven't cracked the major agriculture problems on the planet because our whole global food system is not sustainable right now. But the worst is people dying of chronic undernourishment. And I want to stop that because it can be stopped right now. OK, right over here. As a farm kid, I especially appreciate your comments on that issue. I was just wondering um, how big of an issue you think Dutch disease is with respect to foreign aid and what uh, donor countries can possibly do to reduce that kind of issue. So the, the uh, question is uh, about the Dutch disease, which is a, a uh, non-communicable non uh, disease uh, so named because when Netherlands uh, discovered natural gas in the North Sea, it caused the currency to strengthen and that squeezed the traditional uh, Netherlands exports and that became called the Dutch disease. And when it's applied to the question of aid, the idea is that you give aid and that leads to a kind of a consumption boom and that squeezes out traditional exports. And I think that the, uh, it's, it's not a concern at all to me, zero, for the following reason. It's not aid for consumption, it's aid for investment. And if you give the aid to double the food production, that's the opposite of the Dutch disease. You actually lower non-tradables prices. If you give the aid to help build roads or to extend the power lines and so on, you empower the export sector. So Africa exports almost nothing except a few high-value commodities right now. Diamonds, gold, copper, coal from Mozambique, uh, and uh, hydrocarbons, and so on. Because there isn't really a manufacturing sector or service sector exports, and the main reason is not barriers to their exports abroad, because they face a market that's, for them, even